His name is Muhammad Al Ashari in Arabic. Uh, in English, they just say Muhammad Ashari. Uh, he, he was born in 1951. He was the Moroccan Minister of Culture for about 10 years, up until 2007. Uh, best, actually, originally best known as a poet. He published a lot of poetry uh, and has recently begun writing novels, um, two of them. And uh, he's one of the few Moroccan authors who write in Arabic. Uh, there's not a lot of them. Um, the, what I'm going to read from is the first chapter of his latest novel, which won this year, 2011, the Arabic Booker Prize, uh, which is the main prize for all across the Arab world. So. A lot of authors uh, are in the competition. Um, so, big deal that he won it. Uh, I'm translating it for a new sort of uh, Qatar based press that just started uh, publishing uh, Arabic novels and uh, should come out next year. The novel is called The Arch and the Butterfly. Um, so, it's very different from the two other authors I've read. Uh, and you'll see, I'll be reading for about 12 minutes here. It's a little bit longer piece because it's prose. I'm not reading any of the Arabic. Uh, and the sort of story of the novel is the, it's the story of three generations of a Moroccan family. We're hearing the father's per perspective here. The son, the father has just found out, uh, has killed himself somehow in Afghanistan. Um, and the details of that become clearer later in the novel. But it's the repercussions of, of this event on different generations. When I read the letter with its solitary scrawled line, a cold tremor passed through me. It so removed me from myself that I no longer knew how to end this stupor and return to my senses. Once I finally clawed my way back, there was nothing left. I had become someone else, someone stepping into an empty world for the first time. In this new land, I began to take things in with a certain lack of feeling, which made them all the same in my eyes. I no longer felt a single trace of pain or pleasure or beauty. The only desire I had left was for something to move me, to make me feel again. This was the one thing I could not accomplish. It was quite similar to losing my voice. I could no longer convey anything to other people. No thoughts, no comments, no jokes, no expressions of any kind. I would sometimes answer the questions I was asked by thinking about how someone else would answer them. I was utterly incapable of communicating anything related to feeling, for the simple reason that I no longer felt anything at all. Like darkness driving out the light, this state gradually progressed, spreading from the emotional realm to the material. Thus, one day as I was heading to my office and observing the people with my nose, letting the way they smelled tell me their stories, I suddenly felt that a wall had been erected between myself and the world. When I delved into the matter, I discovered that I had completely lost my sense of smell. This was not the result of some problem with my health, nor was it a gradual waning of my faculties. It was something sudden that had come on without any warning, whether direct or indirect. I was passing by the botanical gardens when I noticed that this human receiver of mine had not picked up a single signal since I had left Burgoon Plaza. That was when I realized that a cold and heavy body had forced itself between me and the world. So I spent the rest of the day going through several different, several different drills to prove that this was a passing delusion. I gulped down all the drinks, hot and cold, that the cafes and bars of Rabat had to offer me. I devoured dozens of different foods. I doused myself with perfume every time I came across a bottle of it. I drew near to every creature that came my way, thinking that I might find some stray scent or the remnant of a fragrance in their wake. I spent many long hours in the steamer, my favorite bar, before leaving it, exhausted and with a heavy heart. Then I spent what was left of the night heading back to the house, that house in whose secret violence I had been living for a quarter century. On the way, I stopped on the bridge across the railroad, gazing down over the railing at the metallic gleam the tracks were still giving off, even though no more trains were expected. I threw up the contents of my stomach in a single heave and it was as if I was vomiting up the man I had been until that day. There had not been a single smell in all this complex chemistry. I was 50 years old during that period, and I'm not sure how I came to have the sudden conviction that I had lost some woman in my life. I wore myself out trying to remember who she was, to no avail. I remembered that something intense had bound me to her, that I had spared no pains in trying to win her back and then I suffered many frustrations on account of her. 
I had a particularly strong recollection of the fact that I had kept on pursuing her. I could not remember the details, only the mental state that pointed to all of this. I thus fell prey to an impressive, op to an oppressive infatuation, that of trying to recall her face or what it was that had led me to her. Every time I failed at this, my infatuation grew. Yet there was not the slightest trace of emotion in the matter. It was as if some mechanical function was moving me, a function that was independent of my own existence, yet also the propulsive force behind it. I believe that this constant burning of my furious mind for a lost woman endowed me with some kind of dark magic, for I came to have an extraordinary seductive power over women, although I found no special gratification in this. One day I realized that all I had to do was exchange a sentence or two with a woman, and I would fall hostage to some love story that had nothing whatsoever to do with me. Then I would have to struggle and strain to break the bonds, generally leaving some of my clothes and skin behind in the process. I took neither pride nor comfort in this, nor any real pleasure. After much reflection, I finally took decisive steps to avoid falling into traps of this kind. Deep inside me, I smiled at the absurdity that was driving me out of my mind after I had spent some 25 years with the same woman. I met her on a wintry day last century, in the 1970s, and married her that very evening. By midnight, I realized that I had made a fatal and irreversible mistake. <laughs> Before I lost my sense of smell, I could tell all the important details of any woman who crossed my path merely from the blend of scents that emanated from her. I could cut through the obscurity of these smells and unpeel their layers with great precision. For example, I could tell the approximate I could tell the woman's approximate age and the color of her skin. I knew what makeup she had on and what her hair looked like, and could even guess the last dishes she had cooked. And sometimes I could tell that she had just had sex, and to what extent it had satisfied her. I could tell all of this without setting eyes on her. As for now, my new situation forces me to use my hands to get to know these details, which requires great care to avoid the coarseness and violence of touch. This takes a lot out of me, and has occasionally led to regrettable incidents. <laughs> it goes without saying that this natural inclination toward getting to know people by their smell was not only a technical matter, but also a visceral one. The deep motor of this skill was a kind of abstract passion, one that had no content to which any names or features could be attributed. It was similar to the passion inherent in pure mathematics. There was no trace of anything tangible in it. Something in the farthest reaches of my burning mind determined what should or should not be. It also goes without saying that my sexual life, by which I mean the adventures and tumult that this term implies, was very poor, and that the few adventures I did have all, had always displaced the woman from the realm of the icon to that of the bed, a tragic transformation that could not be reversed. Yet I should note that my marriage to Bahia Mahdi was not a departure from the iconic realm to the bedroom, but rather a perpetual inability to understand one another. No matter how hard I tried, I was never able to rectify this situation or change its outcome. I at first resisted the loss of my ability to feel pleasure, and the obstacles that grew out of it, through a, kind of comp uh, through a kind of complete and purely technical mastery. I considered my accomplishments in this regard to be expressions of pleasure, but this was not actually the case. In striving for the de deception that this afforded me, I became obsessed with cooking. I acquired an encyclopedic knowledge of wines, and I wrote an important study on Roman sculpture. I also wrote letters to my beloved, reflections on love and despair based on my relationship to the woman that I had lost. My passion for her had returned, even though I still could not properly remember her. I published these reflections in serial form in the newspaper where I worked, before publishing them together as a book. One critic called it the most important work on love since the dove's necklace. I attained the desired effect with all of these accomplishments, namely, utterly deluding myself into believing that I was feeling the most minute and complex pleasures, those pleasures that are, in their essence, bound to the experience of beauty, not only with regards to its existent aspects, but with regards to its potentialities as well. And by practicing this delusion, I strengthened my own conviction that the most important aspect of pleasure was discovering the details of its composition, or, to be more precise, endlessly perpetuating it. Thus, 
The essential part of enjoying a wine, for example, was not the sensory experience of the skilled taster, but rather the chemical compounds that lead him to that experience. In the final analysis, pleasure comes from the sun, or the smell of the soil, or the rain, before finding its way to the fruit and the enchanting liquid obtained from it. Then I came to accept what had happened, as a kind, what had happened to me as a kind of partial death. For when I remembered myself taking pleasure in something, or feeling passion or wonder, it was as if I was remembering someone else, someone who had died before I came to be. I had to accept what was left of me to be able to unite with my former self again, in order to one day go back to the person we had been, a single being whose clockwork wouldn't move normally once more. For this reason, I did not resist, nor did I look for a cure. I merely organized myself in accordance with what I expected of a man who loves life, and steered the helm of this confiscated existence without dictating any conditions to anyone. This was how upended my life became when my only son, who had been pursuing a brilliant education at one of the best French engineering schools, decided to go to Afghanistan and fight with the Mujahideen until he met God. And he did indeed meet God in his very first days there, when he was 20 years old. The circumstances surrounding his death were unclear, and I was unable to shed any light on them. One morning, as I was getting ready to go out, I noticed a letter that had slipped under the door. It read as follows. Rejoice, father of Yasin, for Allah has honored you with the martyrdom of your son. Then my phone rang, and from the man's accent, I could tell that he was from the north of Morocco. He repeated the same cold sentence to me and expressed his formal condolences. I set the piece of table on ta paper on the table and saw my wife lifted toward her face. She started moving the paper back and forth and staggered like an animal that has just been slaughtered before letting out a sharp, vitreous cry and falling to the ground. I struggled to lift her up and drag her into to our bedroom, yet I did not, at any instant, feel the sting of the disaster. I knew it was there, but it had not reached me. I watched as, a, as it expanded in front of me like a blot of oil that was slowly spreading. And I watched the collapse of my wife as if it were merely a bodily thing, until I realized that she had embraced a tragedy that had no limits, as if she were now revenging herself of long years of severity that had, that had never permitted her the, the humiliation of any emotional excitement. I sat and stared at my fingers, which were playing with the death announcement, while looking from time to time at Yassine's face in the picture that presided over the room, the face of him as a child, innocent, fragile, cruel, and sweet. In the blink of an eye, scenes from his life flashed before me in quick succession. From the morning of that day when my wife, as she got out of bed and pulled back her hair with open hands, announced that she was certain she had conceived immediately after our long, calm intercourse of the previous night, to the moment he was crying in the hands of the doctor, and then all the growing up, whether fast or slow, that followed, all the fears and joys and anxieties that came between, and the fierce quarrels about his clothes and his food, his education and his games, his comings and goings, until we were standing at the train station, waiting for him to leave for the airport, and then for Paris, and then into darkness. And then the first and last letter he ever sent us. My studies are much easier than I expected, and the city is much fiercer. I think I'm living out my first love story, later than usual for someone from the El Farsiwi family. I'm not sure that I'm the best of sons, and I'm not sure that you two are the best of parents either. Don't send any money until I tell you. From so far away, I could almost say that I love you, but I'm afraid to. I listened for hours to the police officer as he asked me and my wife about the letter announcing my son's death and the telephone call I had received. We dumbly answered questions about Yassine's friends and acquaintances, his habits, what he read, the music and films he enjoyed, his sports club, and his favorite mosque. It felt like we were putting his entire life back together again and then handing it over, a lifeless corpse, to the officer, who could find nothing more to add except a few questions. Do you agree with the way he died? Sorry, I mean, do you feel sympathy with his cause? Sorry, sorry, you didn't know, that's right, neither of you knew anything. 
Are you sad about what happened? No, I'm not sad, I answered truthfully. From the first instant I heard the news, a violent surge of anger filled my being and prevented me from feeling either pain or sorrow. And if it had been possible for me to meet Yassine at that moment, I would have killed him. Why did he do something so vicious and proud, something so scornful and insulting to me? Why did he push me into the abyss, that chasm whose edge I had been standing on my entire life? And when did this happen? When was that poison seed sown? Before he was born or afterwards? Had he, as, an as a child or an adolescent, been playing with blood-stained hands without us realizing it? Had we been living and walking with a corpse among us? <laughs>